Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program, covering importance of church. And this year, Tuesday morning, Rise and Shine. And this morning here, I'm looking at the topic, Practical Knowledge for Current and End Time Crisis or End Time Emergencies. So, Practical Knowledge for Current End Time Emergencies. So, welcome again to our Live Talk program. Hopefully, you had a blessed night rest and you're ready to take on this day. Let us pray. Our Father, words in heaven, I thank you again for the blessings of your word, for the blessings of your Lord of knowing thee. Pray that you may continue to bless and guide us as we uh, study together these thoughts and these um, concepts and these biblical passages that we may understand your movements for these days, for Christ's sake. Amen. So I'm um, looking at this topic, practical knowledge for current end time emergencies. And so there's certain things that is important for us to learn for what we're dealing with. The Bible already indicate to us what are what will be the state of affairs. And I'll touch a little bit on that. But I want to look at it from the point of view of what is the knowledge to be gained or to be acquired. Uh, so if you know what your challenges are going to be and what you will face, other than just your simple ability to make money and to earn a living and to contribute to society, um, the question is always going to be, what exactly are you supposed to be preparing for? And so if you know what you're supposed to be preparing for, and as we are seeing now, we're seeing many of these things that been um, prophesied, predicted, developing, then it's important to gain that knowledge. Because when you gain that knowledge, you're basically are more prepared or ahead of the game, or you know what to do when you see certain crises is afoot. Uh, so the knowledge um, must be, that knowledge that we need to gain must be considered first important, um, which will fit us uh, to stand in the great day of God's um, preparation. So as we see the coming of the Lord, draw it nigh, and as we see the, the things that are going on around us, then it kind of indicates to us what are we preparing for. And so I want to share with you some thoughts and some biblical passages this morning as to what the Bible outlines will be some of the things that will be happening in the last days and what are you supposed to be doing and I'm supposed to be doing to prep up for those and to get ourselves ready because um, as we're seeing some things that are quite interesting and they're happening, you know, as my think about, you know, so many times I said in the past, this is how I used to look at it. In the past, I used to look at um, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, Revelation 18 towards the end and I would say in the last days, there will be a big increase of um, pharmacia, you know, drugs being used. Uh, and it will be primarily, I would normally think about it in a sense of even in worship, you know, that part of the worship services will be people will be high and then they'll conduct worships, worship service on drugs. And you see those movements, um, those movements are afoot. Uh, so the insight of the Bible gives us and the instruction tells us what's coming. So more and more you see there's these churches um, that are drug-based churches. So uh, they say, well, they have a sacrament and the marijuana or the peyote or any of these things become sacrament. So they're going back to the old religion, the shamanistic type religions. And that was something years back I would always say that I believe this will become a movement. And even recently, I was seeing somebody share with me um, how they went to one of these type of ed gatherings, and it was a church basically that was it was a drug basic basically taking place that was fronting as a church. So it, for healing, you know, they said the marijuana and stuff like that has healing. So this is something that for years ago I said this would be a movement, and um, just reading the Bible, I came to that conclusion uh, or studying that this would be something that the old world religious concept of worship and weed or worship and tobacco, worship and peyote, which is like uh, 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 the the natural LSD, uh, is going to be something that's going to be afoot. So when you notice, then you say, well, what am I supposed to learn to prepare for this? And as we're seeing this, so yeah, so I was going to say, so when I saw this, I didn't think that the level of drug use in the general society was going to be so large. I was more thinking about it from a religious concept, but I always sometimes it slipped my mind that um, the, the the pagans basically would convert the church, not the other way around. So I was not thinking, oh no, this movement is happening in the secular world. 
and then because the church is being converted to the world, the church now takes on that form and sanctify it and sanitize it, so to speak. But they're doing the same thing. It's just they have a religious garb to it. In other words, it's a form of godliness. This is one of the problems in the last days. So as I see this, I started to open my mind to the thinking that many of these things that we're looking at and we would normally say uh, it's a religious issue it's just a worldwide issue it's a global contest and a global change and we see this becoming normal so i'm just going to throw your backdrop to my methodology of looking at these things where before it was be everything is in a religious context and i realized not everything is in a context <laughs> and the context is the globe and humanity humanity just does what they do. So when we talk about what is the practical knowledge or what is the knowledge for the current end time emergencies is from taking that. So first one has to say, what is the emergency? What is going to be happening? Then how do you prepare for that? And what do you need to learn to be able to pre prep you to deal with some of these things coming? And as I say, drug has become so um, ubiquitous. It's so, you know, it's so widespread that is just a normal thing. It's like candy. Uh, but this is something I said was going to happen, but more in a religious context. But now you can see it, that we're here now and it is, you know, the, the, the society is high. You know, even looking at the idea that even anti-retroviral anti drugs are also psychoactive drugs. So even drugs that people are using for AIDS uh, are drugs that will make you go sky high until you touch the sky. So this is the level of stuff that happening. So what are we supposed to be preparing for? So I want to touch on some of that this morning we here with you. I want to um, open your thinking to some of this, that if this is going to happen, what do we do? Now in Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, I'm going to read a few verses all the way down to 13, but there's a few of them. It tells us because this text is important because it kind of gives you some insight as to what was going on in the time of Noah. So Christ says in my 24 that so it was in the time of Noah, so it shall be in the time of the end. It's a, it's going to be a deluge coming. The deluge is coming in from the air and from the ground and it's going to be fire and fire from both top and bottom. So uh, what it is, you know, in the time of the flood, the Bible described that uh, the fire came from the heavens. Uh, no, fire, sorry, water came from the heavens and water came from the deep. Now we know in the deep, what's mostly there is molten lava. So, and then crude oil and stuff like that. So the Bible is very lined up and very clear what's coming, especially according to Peter. So the, we're not going to survive this unless Christ take us off this place. Not this time. Notice here in Genesis 6 verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet this day shall be a hundred and twenty years. So at this point here, the Lord had dropped the age of men. Men were not living as long. And the age was one twenty. Later on, the age would be dropped again to seventy, almost split in half. So when you see a person live to seventy, and shortly thereafter, or right before, they peg out, then you see that the Bible numbers are still right two thousand years later. 70 years, that's all our body can take with the grind of sin, with the beat down of sin. And so we see the lowering of the age. Um, when you read the Angel Weiss writing, she makes it very clear that one of the ways the age was lowered was that men begin to eat meat, and the meat dropped the age drastically. Meat will decimate you. You can see, I always say, you look in society, and you look at those who eat, uh, it's almost like a given now, those who eat a lot of meat, their aging process is rapid. They're like in a race to go to decrepit. You see those who eat no meat, you see the aging process slow down. So even if somebody say, well, that's just coincidence. That's a massive coincidence. Uh, you know, when you do it, you see it, you're almost giving a person, if you see a person 50, 60, 70, and they look phenomenal, you almost assume that they're doing massive supplementation or they're doing no animal product or they're doing both. Um, I would encourage you to do both. So you see this. So here, Noah who build the boat. He go right in ahead and he he builds this um, vessel 
because something big was coming. I start working and they were working for 220 years. It's a long time. I guess in that time, 120 years would be nothing. So the time span of a man, which is 120 years, he used the whole from the man birth until the man die. Noah was building an ark. So Noah built this ark, right? And he was preparing for something that was coming. Uh, what is coming, we can't really prepare for, but the troubles coming, we're told to be prepared for those troubles. Um, and notice the Bible says, the Spirit of God shall not always strive with man, because man is flesh. In other words, man is carnal, man is fleshly. And what's going on in our world today is because man is fleshly. There is not a war that's being fought that is not over covetousness. There is not anything like that's going on. There's something going on with covetousness. It's always linked. Notice verse 5 and 6 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So it's literal pain when you observe human beings. And you can understand that because we are in this period of time when the wickedness of men is great. When you see um, a person can strap a bomb to themselves or fill a car or a truck and drive it into people that are at a wedding and just blow them up. Or in worship or just blow them up, you were like, wow. This is, it, it is things that happen. No, we're, we're having things happening amongst us that it is unimaginable. That you hear it and you can see the video, you see the stuff, and you still like, is that real? Um, I can see why so many people in the secular world believe in false flag operation. Now, that is not possible or it doesn't happen. But even when, even if somebody could say, yeah, it's a false flag operation. Even if say somebody planned it and said, this is what we're doing. We're going to do a false flag operation. We're going to kill a hundred people and we're going to say, it's these people over here. And they came out and said that. But the event itself is so horrendous that I could see people say, somebody would say that in person said, yeah, it's still a false flag operation. Because your brain is as hard to believe that human being can be that wicked. And so that's why every shoot and everything that happened uh, a large percentage of our population, and not the, probably not the majority, but a percentage of the population, like, ah, that's not happening. That's it's all fake. It's all staged. So the bodies are staged? Wow, I don't know what to do with that. I can't deal with it. <laughs> because why? <laughs> because this is where we're going, and this is what's going on in the time of Noah. So what to do? And notice the verse 11 through 13 says, and the earth also was corrupt before God. Now he said the earth. Now we don't know if it's saying here the the just humanity, because you know when people start to sin, their sin is not just amongst themselves and against them, against each other. Uh, it, it is that we see what's going on now and we look at it, the pollution is unbelievable. It is like we did modernity with no concern for the air, the land, or the soil, for the rivers, and the sea, we just basically dump, and we never, we were, we were, it's almost like, like we were so focused on making money, that we weren't focused on the environment, ding, 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 and if you've been paying attention to the news yesterday, but, you know, just focus on creating wealth and rubber barons, that when you look back, you're like, wow, the focal point was just make the money, with no concern for the environment. And so you see this and you look at it, you say, so what's going on? So if you study, so this is now how my, my thinking is, right? So I read this and I said, the earth also was corrupt before the Lord and the earth was filled with violence. So is, is it only violence that created the, the corruption or is it the, the, the bestiality, the pollution, all this type of stuff? So if in this text, I'm not saying definitively that it's speaking to the decimation of the earth. But if this is entailed in this text, then how my thinking is, is that I need to get the best water filters because the earth is being contaminated, so the waters. And so I cannot just depend upon municipal water. I have to depend upon water that are, are either coming from pristine, proven pristine areas, or I might have to get my own filter. Because I'm trying to limit, 
This is what we're talking about here, the practical knowledge for current end time emergencies. I have to limit my damage. Now, somebody might say, well, we all going to die. Yeah, and by God's grace, we all die and go to heaven. But in the meantime, I want to limit my pain and suffering. And I want to encourage you to limit your pain and suffering and the loved ones they have around them, pain around you, pain and suffering. That's why we do these exercises. It is for um, to be able to be woke, as they say, to be awake, to be awakened to what we ought to do for our own best interest. It's, it's not, it's not for, 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 it's for me. It's for me limiting my pain and suffering. Me limiting my decrepitness or my race to become decrepit and to become um, falling apart basically while I'm alive and suffering the ills and pain. And I've seen this where, you know, people falling apart literally like it's a scary movie, their skin coming off and of them while they're alive. Who want to die like that? That's horrible. Anyhow, back to the, away from that horror story. So the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So notice the destruction that came was not a destruction for destruction's sake. But it was, the violence was so out of control. People were in so much pain. When you see some of the violence that are being inflicted right now in our time upon the society by its own members, it is startling to think that somebody would think in this type of manner. And I've said this here before that even you think, because somebody would say, well, you know, people die of sickness. Well, come on. You know, that's their choice. Their diet their diet choice, their lifestyle choices, and we all get old. As a person live out their life and they die and they're 70, you know, it's a, you miss the person and you mourn, but the pain is not as much as when you see a person die and they eat. And worse, when you see a person die because somebody mowed them down with a gun or with a bomb. This is this difficult, difficult to deal with, no matter what you believe. But here God says, I want to bring end to all flesh because the violence they were inflicting upon each other was so terrible. There are some places that you've heard people say they should just go down, go in there and just mow it down. Just bulldoze the whole thing and start over. Uh, it's a mess. Uh, you saw this week in the news that um, there is an accusation of one of the astronauts that she broke into the, she is accused by her ex or soon to be ex wife that she broke into her account or used her account illegally or something like that. And so they said the first crime in space. Well, you know, that's a problem. We could go inhabit the moon or the Mars or Jupiter or Pluto or some new to the discovered planet. And we will bring the problem up there. The problem is not the earth and its resources, it's human beings. So you take this thing, now you see violence, filled with violence, all of that. So you want a knowledge of how to navigate because you want to be able to live your experience and when you die, you die. But to not live a terrible experience. So how to navigate all of this? Just like with Noah, Noah prepared an ark. And so in his preparation for the end time, he knew that, well, the issue that was coming was not just the violence and all that, but it is... The, the water going to come unless you have a big enough boat, boat to float you're going to be done so there's some things that we're given and uh, the list here, I have a short list here of some things that are knowledge that we're supposed to have practical knowledge for the current end time emergency and the last on the list is probably the most important so I'll deal with that last but the first on the list here um, is disaster preparedness uh, this is something that more and more uh, becomes center. I think really from about 2014, this becomes center. There was always hurricanes and always these things. Um, but the type of things that are, we'll call of biblical proportion, 
where it's not just, you know, you have a wind that went through and you lose power, but you have a whole area that a whole island grid, the grid, the electric grid of island could go down. And now you have, if you didn't have any preparation of how to deal with it and how to live without modernity, for a period of time, you'd just be in trouble, no matter who you are. You could have been rich or poor, free and bond, you still be in trouble. If you're in prison, you'd be in trouble. If you're in a high-rise building, you'd be in trouble. You're just in trouble. If there was no preparation. So some of the practical knowledge I believe for this like end time is always going to be just disaster preparation. How to prepare if you're in a zone. Because why I say a zone? Because you see some of these hurricanes, they are, they are, they are large as some of the largest states in the United States. They are larger than islands. So you could have a disaster that is not just a section is crippled. The whole thing everywhere for miles is down. And you're going to be able to survive for a little bit. So have a little beans and rice. Have a little way to hear probably some AM radio or something like that. Having a jump out bag or something to kind of get out and get yourself into a better situation. It's important, I believe. It is not you're going to prepare for a year or two. It is just something to make you can be able to drink some water, eat some food and stuff like that for a few weeks probably, the most. I say that now and the next, you know, something happened and you probably, probably need to be able to survive for a month or two. But something, and this is practical knowledge that one has to have because this is just what we're seeing. We're seeing if you look at the top, I would say 10 hurricanes. No, no, just natural disasters. You know, so the top 10. No, let's deal with hurricanes. The top 10 hurricanes um, in American history all happen. Uh, not top all, but about, I think about six of them happened in the last, I think, five years or something like that. So there's an escalation. Or the last two years, I think. So we've had almost all the hurricanes that have hit. They've become like... Megatron type hurricanes they have hit especially since this new president has come into office and many scientists you can go online just check my word and say you see how powerful this is many scientists can't understand because in the time of president um uh, George Bush there was these mega uh hurricanes and then it, they went quiet except for I think Sandy and then all of a sudden now we have these mega ones all every year. This these mega hurricanes is hitting since this new president take office. And scientists have been trying to wrap their heads. Even theologians have been looking at this and can't understand why, why, why did it went like that? And why did the main hurricane that hit um under Obama hit Wall Street and Wall Street um the workers of Wall Street over there on the New Jersey shore and I always say that see the hurricanes have GPS in them. So disaster preparedness is something important. We also have these massive fires over there in La La Land, they call it. But over there in California, I don't call it La La Land. I'm just saying over there in California, where it's the gay capital of the world, it seems. And the pornographic capital of the world and the Hollywood capital of the world and all that craziness. So th there you have it. So you see these things happening with the fires and stuff like that. You just have to be prepared. You, you know, I have to be, have this type of information, what to do, how to prepare, we have covered this in the past, we'll move on. Now the important point here is to uh, avoid, how to avoid avoid diseases and how to um, overcome diseases, whether it be to cure, heal, overcome diseases, to deal with diseases, especially naturally. Um, I'm always going to say if you're in an emergency, you do what you have to do for the emergency. That's why modern medicine works to a certain degree. It is for emergencies. But when you are talking about long-term diseases, whether it be lifestyle diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, and so forth, or when you're talking about you know the incurables, cancers, and other drug-resistant diseases, one has to be able to have practical means of how to take care of those diseases. If your loved one fall ill, none of us are immune to these things. Or if you yourself fall ill, what to do, how to do it. This is practical knowledge that you need, I need. For these times because this is the reality that's going on around us uh, so many people are dying from all kind of strange diseases and also you know we're talking about autoimmune disease all these diseases how to deal with it 
because this is just an important thing how to deal with mental health notice here one of the major reasons why there's so much wickedness is people have lost their minds um, whether it be bipolar schizophrenia uh, just regular depression I know it's not regular but I'm just saying and it's knowing to deal with this and knowing some solution these are the practical things that we need it's just wanting to say these things are going to happen but to say well we're supposed to know because we're not supposed to be in darkness we're supposed to be like those that walk in darkness and they're tripping and why are they tripping they're tripping because they have no light so avoiding and overcoming and dealing with whether it be minor or major depression schizophrenia anything of the mind anything of the body it is the knowledge that we need and we need to, not only to gain it but to gain more of it another important thing that i believe when we talk about um practical knowledge that is needed for the current end time emergencies is temperance you know i i talk about this here so much because i believe this is one of the ways that the, the devil is destroying people in these last days you think about 40 percent almost of the united states is obese and then the high percentages morbidly or grossly obese so you see this you see this is somebody look at it and say well that's obvious but then a large percent of the population is on drugs and is hooked to some legal or illegal drugs. And then a large percent of the population are really alcoholic, functional drugs. And you keep going on with pornography, with all the other things that happen in the society, you realize self-control is such an important key element, the, what we call the temperance message, because so much of the society is out of control. You got to be so careful even when you're dealing with people because they're intemperate and they have no control over themselves. So this is practical knowledge for the times we're living in that you and I need and you and I need also to teach others because this is what we're dealing with. So many people not gonna, don't go to church, I believe, because they, they, they're, they have another God. Their God is some substance or probably some fried chicken sandwich, sandwich uh, is their God. And that's the belly they're serving. Another thing that we're dealing with that you know will be a major thing in the last days is false doctrine and false winds of doctrine. And when I say doctrines, I mean teachings because there's so much teachings that are even secular teaching. You know, you think about it, you could meet a Christian. How many Christians you have met that believe in a trickle-down theory? And yet the trickle-down theory is not biblical. But they believe in it. And the whole fast to it. And if you say to them, brother, you have a false doctrine. They'll be like, what are you talking about? It's just an economic policy or principle. No, it's a false doctrine. It's against the Bible. God does not believe in that. You know, you'll be happily, you're basically teaching people, give all the concentrated wealth into the hands of the poor. I mean, the rich. This is the philosophy. And yet, that's a doctrine. When you saw understand doctrine is not just what religious people teach but it's what even secular people teach evolution is a doctrine and it's foolishness you know it is so simple to beat that that teaching that you know one day i remember i realized what am i what am i spending all this time trying to outdo or maneuver teaching that is so simple you know it is foolishness at the at the at the at, at the so simplistic to overcome it's just one thought <laughs> and it's nonsense you know the the concept of the survival of fittest and the proof who is a superior race this is a nonsense but again these are the doctrines that are floating around and seem sophisticated and seem to be difficult to deal with you like wait a minute that's nonsense um another big thing that is similar to mental health that i believe is what the devil is doing is isolation i can't believe the day i would be saying that you know isolation and there's a text i'm going to read for you in a second some text i'm going to read for you so think about that you, you know i would not think 20 years ago that this would be something on any list of practical information that you and i need to know to help your fellow human beings and to help yourself would be a teaching would be something and i title it isolation how not to become isolated you know, it's it's like the dragon is trying to get you and me and you were running from the dragon. And the dragon is trying to cut, cut you off. Just like how a lion chases uh, a little 
I don't know if they call him Bambi, but a little dare, a little gazelle. And that's what the lion trying to do. It's trying to cut it off from the pack. And then that's it. It's going to surround it and eat it. And when you understand how a lion hunts or any of these predatorial animal hunt, they go for the young, they go for the weak, they go for the slow, they go for whatever. And we are called to protect those. Those who are stronger are to look out for those who are weak. And one of the ways the devil do, does this is to isolate you. If he can get you on your own, cut you off from the church, cut you off from your brethren, then he can eat you. And so many people you see, they just, and the whole pack is running. And for some reason, they get isolated. They get distracted. They saw a billboard and they like start looking at the billboard. And they you know, they get isolated from the pack and the, the lion just run out. <laughs> And just eat them up. And you'd be like, oh man, that, the blood splatter right there. And you see this all the time amongst people. And so that's the aim of the devil. And as I say, here my I almost only time stamp this. That I'm looking at the thing and thinking, you know, this is a big problem. So many people are isolated and then next you know you're burying them because they kill themselves. And then they say, oh, I was lonely. And because you're lonely, son, you kill yourself. Wow. And so you say to somebody, hey, come and hang out. They'll be like, no, the depression is telling me that I should stay by myself. <laughs> and that's it. And then you see the devil come and just eat them. And that's what's happening. So this is, to me, a key information. Don't get yourself isolated. I'm going to read a text for you. Just in case you're thinking it's some weird out idea there. Then you'll be kind of, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of straightforward. <laughs> but I would, I would not per se see this you see that's what the bible is powerful when i read the text in a second it's hebrews 10 you know the text um and the bible says when you see the day coming know that you need to draw near to your peoples draw near to the brethren but i would i would never think that would be a big thing i would just think you're just church folk you see i wouldn't think it would be a movement in secular society where isolation is causing people to die and to murder people and to commit suicide and to just say, I'm going to wipe everybody up because I can't get a girlfriend and I have no friends. And yet the Bible tells us, don't get it, get yourself isolated. Don't get yourself cut off because the devil will eat you. And he's eating people literally. The Bible is rock solid, I'm telling you. Uh, financial independence, we'll touch on some text for that. This is very important. Financial independence is, is important because, as you know, the devil is trying to do again is to control everybody. If you see what's going on right now, as you know, the Bible predicts that the United States will use its financial global control to basically force the world to persecute the righteous, to force them into a mark of the beast. So when you understand it, you see how one of the most powerful tools that the United States use against other nation is is isolation and then financial crippling. It'll cripple you financially. So it's important for you to understand and have the practical knowledge of how to be financially independent. This is important, especially if you preach, because if you preach, you notice, if, if somebody say, you're just saying this because the Bible, think about it. If there's a disagreement with two parties in America, they try to cripple the other person. It don't matter, liberal or, or conservative. Try to get you to lose your job, cripple you, shut you down. And it doesn't matter if they're left or right. If somebody says something racist, the first aim is to get them to get fired. If somebody says something that they don't like and they're more liberal, they want to get them fired. This is the focal point is to financially cripple you. But when you're financially independent, the more independent you become, it becomes very difficult to shut you up. So you, 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 you or me can preach certain things and somebody cannot like it. And somebody could try, but it's going to be difficult. It's doable. There's a pathway to make it happen, but it'd be very difficult. But it's doable because the person will try to financially cripple you. And if I can financially cripple you, I can shut you up. Or I can hit you where it hurts. Where, let's see now, if you're broke, you, you're going to still preach. So that's why it's important for people like myself. Just We were preaching before we had $5. And that's just it. So it, it's just, we're preaching because we're preaching. 
is not, you know, whether we have it or not. But the independence is a good thing because some of what we do, we need funds. And I always know that certain people will listen, but they'll never support. Because I know deep down inside, probably they would be like, you're going to starve. You won't get a dime from me to help you preach. Because some of what we do, we need money. So that's why I come to a point where I, I realized I had to be financially independent in the sense of I have certain people that support. And you, you notice here, I, I used to, but I don't ask anymore. Other than the, the replay, the thing that I play over and over again, the support, revive from. I, I, need, I need whoever I need their money. They know who I need their money. But I don't need other people's money. You get independent of that because, again, that will control if you can preach or not. Because they can cut off financial support. Uh, so if I say certain things I'm saying, because I believe it's been fair. So you can see that. I'll show you some text in a second. Um, Self-supporting. So these are two concepts that, you know, you, if you probably watch my group and you listen to me, you realize that I really believe in this because I believe this is what they're trying to do in the end. Self-supporting, that means within yourself, you support yourself. You don't need outside entity to, to, to support you. We are connected in this world because we live in this world. We're not independent of people per se, but you want to be as self-supporting as possible. That means you become an ecosystem within yourself. So if your outside support get cut off, then it matters, it hurts you, but it doesn't go dev devastate you. You know, so it's like, you see the same thing happen on a global scale. Think about this. You have a country that has a financial embargo and it still su survives without, without trading with the country that embargoed it and the other, you know, peons that join in the embargo so this is kind of where you have to be as you can't survive because you have to be able to find people to deal with your own people it doesn't mean that like say for instance take cuba as an example cuba has been on the financial embargo for i think from 1954 and it's still alive no it it it, it greatly damaged it um i shouldn't even say greatly damaged it affected it in a negative way but he had other people he was dealing with so he was able to still stay in the Western Hemisphere, not do financial dealings with America, still stay afloat. But I, I, it, it is at a difficulty. I remember one of the greatest things that Cuba did was nothing to do with communism and anything like that. To me, the best thing it did was crippled South Africa, crippled the apartheid regime, I should say. Crippled it. It uses whatever it had financially and whatever backing it had. And it basically wasted all of its resources to cripple South Africa. So that is a, you know, I was, from what I see, unless somebody can show me something differently, from what I see, that was phenomenal that you're able to even, while on the embargo, take on an evil empire at the same time. So do a, a, a good, even if you say, well, even if the only thing I did good was to cripple that evil empire, I did it. So I think that's that's a phenomenal. Look that up. You see what I'm talking about. If you never heard such a thing, you see the role of um, that Cuba never really got proper um, credit for, for basically went to war, and back Angola, and basically crippled the South African regime, and broke it financially. So this is where independence came because if they weren't independent and they were part of the, they weren't embargoed. I believe South Africa probably still would be around. Just like how Israel is around, because remember, Israel is being supported just like how South Africa was being supported by America. Israel is being sort of sub supported by America. So if you you don't have, you need to have a country like Cuba who was independent. They couldn't think, you know, I'm going to do this because they would have to consult with their partners in the U.S. And the partner would say, no, 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 you can't cripple them. They are trading partners. We have to protect them. We benefit from the suffering of the South Africans. So it's important. So self-supporting. Financial independent become important because the aim is to shut everybody up. And you see now certain things you would never hear in the main line. Even if you take that snippet that I just said, the last three minutes, you would never hear this in a main line organization, church. Uh, because it's the independent to say that type of stuff is just not there. And to put that out there so you can look into it and say, oh, no, I'm getting it. I see this. It's, it is to stop you, shut you down. So you can't, you can't say a word. And you see those people in those type of what I think is like the plantations, the the ministers that work in those plantations, 
they say they're free, but they're not free. They can't say certain things. They might can talk about it privately, but the plantation owners would not allow them to. So when we get off the plantation, we can say those things because we run away. And we're going to stay off the plantation, praise the Lord. So how to receive the seal of God is last thing here. This is a practical thing you and I need to learn. And this is probably, to me, not probably, but definitely the most important. To receive the seal of the living God. Why others are receiving the mark of the beast. You can see them right now. That's they can see they're getting geared up to receive it. We want to be able to know to receive the seal of God. That's the practical knowledge. So now I'm going to read for you the next 20 minutes now some text to encourage your soul to learn these things, to receive these things, um, see value in learning these things because these are the things that prepare us for the second coming of the Lord Almighty. Notice this here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 through 32. And I don't need the whole section. I'm just going to read it for your encouragement. But I need verse 24 um, and 25. But I'll read the whole thing for context. Notice it says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we draw near straight. We honest when we draw near to each other. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he that is faithful that promise. For he is faithful that promise. Verse 24 and 25 now. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So to provoke unto love and to good works. That's why we come together. We don't get isol isolated. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So when you see the end time coming, you see things are kind of looking a certain way. You see the embargoes. You see the 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 the, the thing to cripple you. You see um, the immorality. You see the violence. Then you take verse twenty four and twenty five to heart. You consider one another, and you come together to provoke one another to love, to good works. While others are isolating themselves and provoking themselves to um, you know. Instagram and Pornhub and and YouTube with all the violence and stuff like that and through video games and through covetousness. We are assembling together, associating together to provoke unto love and to good works each other. We're trying to stir each other up to say, hey, love more. <laughs> Do some good works. While the mainline Christian church is talking about grace and faith and no works, you leave those crazy people by themselves. And you go and you provoke each other to good works and ignore the nonsense, noise that they're preaching. Notice verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of herself together as the manner of some is. So some people, and I, you know, as I say, I used to be around people like that. They're constantly cried to be by themselves, to be isolated. And as I say, isolation and by yourself is always connected to depression. You show me a depressed person, you show me a person like to be by themselves. It is marvelous. It's like, ah, you know, it's like, stop. You're depressed. You always hide, running and hiding from people. You deal with depression. You know, it's, it's just part of it. It's isolationism. Isolationism is a sickness. It's the person's hiding their wickedness and their failings. Man, come out and be blessed. Oh, you're running, to, running from or running to. So not forsaking the assembly of herself together as the man of some is. You think about it. You love people, right? That's the best thing you can have. You shouldn't be running from people. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So when you see like, wow, things look like it's wrapping up. It's not time to say, oh, it's time for me to run away. <clears throat> it's time for me to connect, to gather warmth from the coldness of others. When others are getting cold because their heart is just cold, you're trying to get your heart warm up. How are you going to get warm? If you're cold, you know how the way to get warm is to pull close to somebody, squeeze them, <laughs> pull them in. 
Um, verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised that Moses' Lord died without mercy on the two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, say ye, shall he be though thought um, worthy, who had who had trodden underfoot the Son of God, and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that had said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endure a great fight of afflictions. So that's where we need to be. We need to always go back to when we first accepted the Lord, when we first got hot. We just got ready, ready to preach, ready to whatever. And as you normally would know the story, people get zeal to come in church. They have no knowledge, but they have zeal to get excited. The people, old people in the church, they're dying, waiting to die. And they try to hold that zeal, put it out, try to show you that you don't know. Well, that zeal has to be there. You got to be fired up for the gospel, fired up for Jesus. So that's a good thing. It's good to have some fire, some excitement for life and for gospel. Praise the Lord. So this is the type of practical knowledge we need. We need to know what am I supposed to be doing while others are moving away. Remember, our theme always is the importance of church. While others are moving away from this type of knowledge that we're talking about, we're trying to pull into it. While others are trying to get themselves locked up into systems and to be part of the main line and part of the secular world, we're trying to learn self <laughs> self-sufficiency we're trying to learn um independent in our finances independent in our preaching we're trying to learn how to become self-supporting we're trying to learn about temperance about dealing with things that they're not dealing with because they're just in the fun and games we're moving a different direction but you don't do this i mean i guess i can do this by myself but it becomes more um a press or a push when others are moving, you know, there's many people who will overcome intemperance from, say, drugs, alcohol, because they have a group support. It's easy as human beings. We're social creatures. Uh, we, we, we sin in groups and we overcome in groups. Now, we all have to answer to God for our own self, but we are born in families. We are born uh, in society. We are born in a church. We belong to schools, organizations. That's just how God put it. Yes, we might answer to God for ourselves, but we overcome not in isolation. You know, is iron sharpened iron? It's not iron rub against the wind or against the Holy Spirit or the holy angels and get sharpened. We are made to bless each other. You listen here because you're gathering from me something that I've gained. And uh, it's a blessing to be able to give. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. But we all receive and we all give. Um, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 17, uh, taking the point here, Revelation 13, verse 6, 15 through 17. Notice here it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So now the image of the beast is Sunday sacredness. This is the United States being talked about that there's come a point in history, in the future, I should say, where America will institute a, a, a rule that if you don't worship God on the first day of the week, that you should be killed. This is coming. And we can see this movement coming because we know one of the things that will precipitate this movement is that the wickedness will become so great that the religious leaders and the political leaders will join together and come up with this concept that probably what the people need is more religion. and But they'll in turn persecute those who are living by the commandments of God. This is what's coming. And as this draw near, we know that in order for this to happen, America would have to overturn its constitution. If it does do that, then it's no longer 
the United States of America. It becomes a rebel empire. So this is what's coming. So notice here now. So if that's what's coming, then we need a knowledge to be prepared for this. Because notice it says, if you don't worship the image of the beast, what is the image of the beast? It's basically a religious intolerance, so to speak. So it's a, some rule that is set in place that you're persecuted if you don't follow. What was the rule? What was the beast doing or the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages? It basically, if you didn't agree with it, it will persecute you. And one of the primary ways the Catholic Church persecuted people in the Dark Age, the Christians in the Dark Age, was a refusal to do the Mass. You know, the, 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 the religious service that they do, which is a variation of the communion service in the Bible. So if you didn't partake of the Mass, you believe the Mass was blasphemy, which is it is. It is. The Mass is a blasphemous act. It's a very cursed act. They have now claimed that the wafer is the body of Christ, literally. And the blood is the literal blood of Christ. It's blasphemous. And this is what they have done. So now in the Dark Ages, the Christians say, we ain't worshiping. We ain't going to do that. We disagree. We believe you're wrong. And this is what started off the massive persecution. So we see this. So we know the, the, it's going to be something around the enforcement of some falsehood. Back that time, it was about the mass and other things later on come along. But the mass was one of the main things. It was this abominable act that goes against God. Uh, in our time, we believe it's going to be Sunday sacredness. That's what we believe. So what happened there? It will force now. It will say, well, you do it or you die. And verse 16, notice now, and it calls all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead. And verse 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the or the number of his name. And the number of his name, his name when you calculate it, is six hundred and sixty six, which is the name of the Pope um on top of his you know, his 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 mitre. So anyhow, so when you look at this and you say, Well, what what do I need to do? What we know is very clear that we need to have a knowledge of how to be able to sidestep this as much as possible. Now we know ultimately as the law become more enforced that we are told that it will be impossible to escape it without the um, intervention of God's holy angels. And I can't imagine a hundred and something years when Andrew White penned that concept uh, that it was going to become such a powerful law and such an enforceable law that at that time, America was becoming one of the greatest nations on the earth, but it was not. It did not have the military might and the sophistication that you cannot. He has military bases around the world. I think 140 or 130 military bases. You cannot escape his military might anywhere you go. So if he says, this is what we're going to do, it has the ability to wherewithal to back it up. And the only two nations really could stop it would be Russia and China. Probably North Korea. So anyway, so think about that. So here we have, it says, that no man might be able to buy or sell, say that you have the mark and the name of the beast and the number of the name. Also that nobody will escape it, even if you're rich or poor. So when we are taught about self-supporting, self-independent, financial independence, when we're taught about a plant-based diet, when we're taught about simple living, country living, learning to farm your own food um, because you have to be away. When we understand that there'll be so much wickedness that the, un the most unsafe places in the upcoming years will be in the major cities because of the massacres and the diseases. So we see that this is practical information. Because remember, when Europe went into the Dark Ages, in this, in a sense, what they did, they called forth the wrath of God upon them. And so where did most of the wrath of God get executed it was in the cities. So the Christian, because they were fleeing persecution from the Catholic Church, they fled to the the um the mountains. 
And, and I, know, I was a man, I always thought that the best way to say it really is the Catholic Church, but it's really the Christian Church that went into rebellion and started persecuting its own. As Ellen G. White says, our biggest fear is from our own brethren. It's internal is always the biggest fear. So anyhow, so if, if I'm learning, what do I need to learn? I need to learn how to survive all of this as much as possible. Some won't, some will. But if you know how to and you know what's coming, then you make your preparation. And if you're told, like statements in Revelation 18, verse 1 through 4, get out of her, my people, then you start to know, okay, these are the preparations I need to make. If you're knowing, okay, they're going to try to cut us off financially, then I know this is the preparation I need to make. If I know when they do this, that the judgments of God will fall in the city areas because that's mostly where they control. And that's where it's easy for them to enforce. So I need to be out of the city. I need to start learning how to survive without their modernity because remember financial embargo where you can't buy or sell affect whatever they're buying they're selling so if i'm not if i can't survive without buying what they're selling then i can survive this is what basically cuba proved that if to a large degree if they learn to do organic farming they didn't need pesticide if they can't make it they don't use it and so forth and so on more than that but it's just we almost out of time so if you look at like Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 and 4, and it talks about the seal of God and uh, the punishment, if you look at Revelation, that part of Revelation, you see real quickly that in the 6th century, the Muslims became one of the curse upon Europe because the Muslims started to attack Europe relentlessly from about the 6th century. But if you understand the Bible, you realize they were there as a punishment for the wickedness that Europe was doing to the Christians. It was a blowback. It was part of God's system of saying, oh yeah, you can beat up God's people, but this is what I'm going to do to you. And that's why I say you learn these things, you start to see God's hand and what people will call terrible. Uh, it is terrible, but it is God's movement to hold back the, the winds of wickedness that is blowing upon the earth by these evil empires. And you start to see this and it becomes, oh, that's how God works. You know, I've said this before. I remember, um, because I'm out of time, I just say uh, a few more texts I wanted to read, but we move. I always remember, and I always say this because I remember this was so powerful. I remember when the Patriarch Act was was written, many people, many people were happy because they thought, oh, this was to protect America. But those of us who knew what was going on and knew where this was going, Many people started to say, wait a minute, this was an overreach because they came up with the NSA and all these type of things to go and infiltrate churches. And they came up with all these things, which are still on the books and it's still being done. To eavesdrop and cause, to do illegal search and seizure. Every single thing of the Constitution was that protect its citizens was broken in that rule and in that law. So the passage, I remember people started to like, man, I have to be careful what I say. Anywhere that is audible, uh, if it's not one-to-one -one where I'm talking in your ears, can't talk. And, you know, this is before the time of Snowden and all these people. And these were the rules passed. And they said, oh, you know, the rules were passed so that we can protect ourselves from terrorists, which I believe that's, that issue exists because of Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 onwards. But... You know, realize real quickly that this was the type of draconian law that basically the Constitution forbids, and you can't, you can't do Revelation thirteen verse eleven onward. You can't pass a mark of the beast without changing America. Now America uh, uh, can oppress anyone. And I remember this, but I remember shortly after, then the big storm started to come. This was under President Bush, and this is why I think the. The scientists and the religious community can't understand, can understand the Bible and God works. You see, and I remember when the first, I think it was Rita or Katrina hit, I was like, wow, because it just totally crippled the president. All this type of move about the NSA just got shut down. And then after that came in, then there's a financial crash, more storms and then financial crash. And then we have a liberal president that was a constitutional president and it was a, a what we call a community organizer and i said wow god can slow it down then we we pick up back again with putting people in cages so we know where this is going talking about building a wall 
you build a wall in the southern border. I really don't care about those people are coming in. I more care about them caging us in and trying to trap us inside of the country. So they can persecute the righteous. So you can't flee. Um, if it sounds crazy, because it is. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of this day. I pray that the Lord may be with us, that we might truly receive the knowledge even more than I wanted to come cover here to prepare us, dear Lord, for the end times, to know really what's going on, to know what the evil empires and the evil um, secret society people out there are doing under the guise of the government and the church. May you bless us, dear Lord, and may we be wake, awakened or woke that we might make the right moves. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning where we should do natural health. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.